Many people wonder at the straight line cut into the cliff at Lusty Glaze Beach. This short video will help explain what this is and the historical significance of it. This video is dedicated to Mrs Bill Glanville who supplied many of the images used in this video. A font of knowledge and a huge contributor to Cornwall's heritage through her research and sharing her wide experience. Bill's passing is a great loss to her community and to Cornwall, and she will be remembered with great affection by her many friends. During a period of British history, from about 1790 to 1810, there was what became known as Canal Mania. Following completion of the very successful Bridgewater Canal in 1761, canal building intensified. Although Cornwall's terrain is not conducive to canal building, this would not deter John Edivine from attempting to construct one between Lusty Glaze in St Colour Minor Parish to St Morgan Porth. Farmland was not as productive in the 18th century as it is now, and to improve the soil, sea sand and seaweed were added to the soil, known then as manure. This was augmented from time to time by unwanted or unsold fish, such as pilchards and mackerel. The St Cullum Canal scheme aimed to transport sand, seaweed and stone between Lusty Glaze and Morgan Porth to supply farms and offload this along the canal route. John Edeving was a wealthy man believed to have come from St Orsall. He was an advocate of the canals that were being built across all of the country. In 1773 he obtained an Act of Parliament for the construction of a semi-circular canal to run from Morgan Porth to St Cullum and back to the sea at St Cullum Porth. To avoid building locks, tugboats would be used that could be raised and lowered using inclined planes and lifting equipment. Access at each end of the canal was via an inclined plane, basically a steep ramp. The one at Lusty Glaze, although now much eroded, can still be seen, as can some parts of the canal which were completed. The canal was dug to Ryleton at the 100 foot contour line passing under the path from St Colour Minor to Penrose. There were a number of issues that prevented the completion of the canal. The St Colour men would not hold water. The Morgan Porth end running from Trenance Point nearly to Whitewater ran along the 200 foot contour line and was used for two to three years. The canal was to use tub boats, square vessels carrying up to five tonnes each, used on many canals, including the Cornish Bude Canal. After completing two sections, but having spent all of his own considerable fortune and most of his sister's money, Edwin realised he was unlikely to obtain any real return on his investment, gave up and died soon afterwards. An unsuccessful attempt was made to complete it in 1829. In 1791, a letter written to the publication Monthly Review mentioned a meeting between the writer and John Edivine, probably shortly before his death, and this makes interesting reading. The meeting with Edivine, then virtually blind, was somewhere along the banks of a completed stretch of the canal. The writer relates the encounter and talks of Edivine and his work in glowing terms. He said, Throughout the course of the canal, there was an abundant display of mechanical tr contrivance. The writer also wrote of Edivine, agreeably surprised at finding a precious jewel in this obscure nook of the country, and lamenting his fate, I now feel a real satisfaction in seeing a remembrance of him before the public eye, and in doing him an act of justice in respect to an idea which he certainly first conceived. In memory of John Edivine and the St Cullum Canal that bears his name, a memorial stone and plaque were raised on the Barrowfields overlooking Lusty Glaze Beach where the inclined plain can clearly be seen today.